basic minimum configuration that will put 8085 IC onto work, right? So we will bring some other components and we will attach it to 8085 microprocessor IC that we will do. But the primary purpose here is to be able to understand the IC pin diagram of 8085 or the functional pin diagram of 8085, right? So that is the purpose of today. So here, if you see, this is how the integrated circuit of 8085 look like, looks like. Now, 8085 comes in various variants, and in our course, we have 8085A variant. So we are going to deal with that only. So this is uh, manufactured by Intel company, and this is how the integrated circuit looks like. This is a DIP package, dual, a dual input package. I mean, if you see, it's rectangular in shape, and on both the sides of rectangle, there are these legs or IC legs, which are 20 in number in one side and 20 in number on the other side. So it's a completely 40 pin IC, 40 pin uh, DIP package, which is used uh, inside your integrated circuits to manufacture a basic microcomputer system, right? So you might have seen ICs of this type in your digital logic course when you did your experiments on uh, breadboard. So how many of you have actually seen a breadboard in laboratories? Have you seen a breadboard in laboratory? Virtually at least? Yes, sir. Uh, you have seen a breadboard, right? So uh, on to, onto that breadboard, you can mount this IC and this IC will be connected to several other components and your microcomputer system will be manufactured, right? However, uh, first of all, we need to understand this complete IC. So this is 8085A, the same IC that you see here. And you can see that there is this uh, cut mark here or U-shaped cut here. What does this signify on an integrated circuit? Can somebody quickly tell me? This cut mark that you see here, which is uh, shown at the top of the IC, what is the significance of this? Is it accidentally there or there is some purpose to it? Anyone in the class? Yeah, Shivam, uh, you were raising your hand. Can you tell? Oh, so you have put off your hand. No issues, I will let you know. So integrated circuits, you know, uh, all of these pins are there. There are 40 pins. So uh, we should have some numbers which are assigned to these pin. So how can, how can we do that numbering? So for that numbering, this uh, cut is provided here. This is a U-shaped cut. And uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you see here in the actual pin diagram, so here this U-shaped cut will appear here. They have not drawn it here, but it should have appeared here, that U-shaped cut. And that simply signifies that in counterclockwise direction from the starting of the cut, you start your numbering in U-shape, right? So. The numbering starts from 1 till 20 on this side, and then it continues from 21 to 40 on that side. Is it understood, the purpose of cut and how numbering is done in integrated circuits? Yes. In IC? Yeah. So this is a very simple thing. So it has got 40 pins. What is the basic requirement to start an IC? If you put an IC on the breadboard and you want that to function, what are the basic arrangements that you have to make after putting it on breadboard so that it becomes on? You have to give a power supply and you have to give a ground signal. Is it or is it not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So here you can see at pin number 40, you don't need to remember all these pin numbers or even these pins in this order. This is just for the purposes of explanation. So at pin number 40, you can see that plus 5 volt supply can be applied here, right? And at pin number 20, there is this ground signal. So to be able to start the IC, this is the basic minimum requirement. You have to give it a power supply and the power ratings are plus 5 volt here and the ground signal has to be provided here. Uh, so uh, since this circuit, 8085A, since this integrated circuit, uh, it works on clock because as we have discussed earlier that in microprocessors, they function according to certain clock. So after supplying this power supply and the ground voltage, we have to apply a clock to this microprocessor, right? So the terminals that you see here, X1 and X2, they are used for connecting 
crystal oscillator x1 and x2 between these two terminals a crystal oscillator is collect, uh, connected and that crystal oscillator should have twice frequency as compared to the frequency on which this 8085a operates so we will discuss the reason of this why why this is so that if this microprocessor operates on certain frequency then between these two points you have to apply a crystal oscillator of twice that frequency so why is that we will discuss it in a short while but before that let us first discuss what is the frequency on which 8085a can operate so the frequency range on which 8085a can operate is 500 kilohertz to 3.125 megahertz this is the frequency range 500 kilohertz to 3.125 megahertz right ideally we take the upper limit to be 3 megahertz 3.125 megahertz is as good as 3 megahertz so this microprocessor will operate on at max 3 megahertz right but it starts from 500 kilohertz so could someone identify the reason if this microprocessor could operate on 3 uh, megahertz then why do we take the range to be very wide i mean from kilohertz to megahertz could somebody identify the reason for that okay uh, answer this question if the microprocessor operates on higher frequency it will be better or if it operates on lower frequency then it will be better you all have microprocessors in your computer systems so please answer this question would it be good if the microprocessor operates on higher frequency or lower frequency higher higher frequency because higher frequency mm. means more number of operations per second so it should operate on a higher frequency but uh, this is not always true for example in your mobile phones when you play your games uh, and if they become heated because of some reason because of overplaying the games for prolonged duration of times so they become heated the device becomes heated so do you notice a, a reduction in speed or maybe frame drops when your mobile becomes heated yes or no yes sir yeah why is that it is because whenever microprocessor senses that the temperature of the system has been raised so to cool down what it does is the operating frequency on which the microprocessor operates is lowered that is why we keep a range from 500 kilohertz to 3 megahertz 3 megahertz is the best case frequency on which it should operate with some optimal workload but if the workload increases but the increment of workload to this electronic circuit will simply mean that the electronic activity inside the circuit has increased and when the electronic activity that is the flow of electrons uh, or positively charged particles inside this circuit will increase and amount of heat will be generated so if excess amount of heat is generated the only option is to uh, put the operating frequency to some lower level so that the operations are slowed down and the flow of electrons inside this is slowed down for certain duration of time and in that duration it starts to cool off right so that is why you notice a glitch or maybe some kind of reduction in speed when your mobile phone heats up and not every microprocessor is clocked at the maximum or the best frequency if you have a qualcomm processor inside your microprocessor it might be clocked at a frequency which is lower than the actual maximum operating frequency of the microprocessor right so uh, if you have even if you have a very good processor the clock frequency can be kept low to operate it at lower speeds right so that's what we mean by this i mean uh, 8085a operates in the frequency range of 500 kilohertz to 3.125 megahertz and ideally we would like to operate it on 3 megahertz and for that purpose we have to apply a 6 megahertz clock at the terminals x1 and x2 so why do we do that we do that because this microprocessor will not be the only component which is present in the circuit together with this component there will be multiple peripherals and supporting devices which are attached to microprocessor so some of those peripherals they will also operate on some clock frequency right so to be able to provide that clock frequency to the external peripherals i mean 
you can see that this uh, 37 number pin has got a clock output. The arrows uh, with every pin, they indicate the direction of flow of data. So this clock pulse, it will be given to the external peripherals which are attached to the microprocessor. So whatever is received from this input pin numbers one and two, it will the frequency will be divided through a toggle flip-flop inside this microprocessor, 3 megahertz will be used by this and the rest of the frequency it will be supplied as an output for the externally interfaced devices or peripherals, right? So that whichever of them requires clock, we will see that if they require clock when we will attach devices. So it will be available from here only, right? And then the next thing is, these many basic components are required to start the microprocessor. A voltage supply, a ground signal, a crystal oscillator of twice the frequency uh, at which we want the microprocessor to operate, right? And then, you know, if something goes wrong in the system, if the system is not in your control, what do you do to your computer systems? You reset your systems, right? You reset your systems. So uh, you have got this reset pin here, just beneath the clock, you have got this reset pin. It is an input and it has a bar over it. What does this bar mean in digital logic? If some signal is there and you put a bar over that, what does that uh, that mean? Negative. Complement. Uh, it simply means mm -hmm. that that signal is active low signal, right? Active low means whenever you will supply an input of zero here, then this signal will be activated. So there are two things. Uh, one thing is activating a signal and deactivating a signal. Second thing is, active low or active high. So these are two very different things, right? So reset in bar. I mean, if you see the other normal signals where there is no bar, if there is a value of one which appears at that input, the it will be treated as activated. The signal is activated. But for the signals where this bar is written, if a value of zero will be supplied, those signals will be activated. So if a signal is active, it does not mean its value will be equal to one. Its value can be zero, depending upon whether that signal is active low or active high. So reset pin is an active low pin. So if you supply a value of zero here, then the complete microprocessor will be reset, right? So if something goes wrong in your system, you can always reset this microprocessor by supplying a zero uh, voltage here, right? So uh, you, you might have noticed that apart from this reset pin, there is also a pin which is called as reset out. So this reset out pin is actually used to be able to reset the peripherals that are attached with this microprocessor, right? This reset out is used whenever your microprocessor is reset by this reset input pin, this reset output pin will also be high and this reset output pin is usually connected to the other peripherals. So they will also be reset. So for that purpose, you have got this reset out pin. So is the meaning of this voltage pin, ground pin, clock inputs at crystal oscillator X1 and X2, reset input pin and reset output pin and clock output pin are clear to everyone? Yes or no? Sir, please explain one yes. second, reset in and reset out. See, reset in is a simple pin. If you want to reset the microprocessor or restart the microprocessor, you provide a value zero here because it's an active low pin. And uh, since the microprocessor is reset, we also want all of the peripherals which were attached with the microprocessor, they should also restart themselves, right? So uh, it never happens that you switch off your computer, so only the microprocessor will be switched off and the uh, monitor will remain on. It never happens like that. So if the microprocessor is resetted, every device which is attached with it should also be reset. So that is why to indicate to every device that the microprocessor has been reset by an external signal, this reset out signal is given and this reset out signal is connected to the different peripherals so that whenever the microprocessor is reset, all of the other devices should also be restarted. So is it okay? These are very simple signals to start and stop a microprocessor. Yes, sir. Right? Now, uh, now let us, uh, let us talk about, you know, connecting the externally interfaced memory to the microprocessor. So externally interfaced memory, as we all know, it has got uh, 64 kilobyte, that is 2 raised to the power of 16 total memory locations. So to be able to address 2 raised to the power of 16 memory locations, we need to have 16 bits of address bus, right? So you can see here, AD0, 
to AD7. Then after that, uh, this A8 to A15. These are all address bus lines. These are all address bus lines which will be providing the address of the external memory to be accessed, right? And since every memory location in the externally interfaced memory is of one byte, it is of one byte. So there should be a data bus which will carry the data from that or uh, I mean it will take the data from it or give it give the data to it. So on that purpose we have multiplexed address and data lines. So AD0 to AD7 you can see that these are 8 bits or 1 byte. They are bidirectional. They are bidirectional because data can be given and taken. Data can be given and taken to and from the external memory. So uh, the data for one location will be one byte and that is why we have got this one byte which is bidirectional in nature. So uh, this lower order byte of the complete address bus is multiplexed with the data bus. This is what we have talked about earlier also. That is if, if I give you an example that suppose if you have got, if you have got a tenant in your house and the room which you have rented out is a room which is inside your house. And the tenant has made the guarantee that he will be using your door only two times. In the morning, he will leave for work. And in the evening, he or she will return from that door. So your door will be busy only two number of times. So uh, rest of the times, your family can use your door multiple number of times and there is no problem. That's what we have already said. So there is no need of making an additional door for the tenant as a separate entry or exit, right? So in the same way, when we know that the addresses which will be used on the address lines will be will be used very less frequently. For example, somebody has specified that um, if you have to access memory, uh, you have to access the memory, external memory, and you have to take data from this particular location. So if that location is specified, the address can be given from address lines AD0 to AD7 and A8 to A15. Once that address has been given as an output, you can see that these are all uh, unidirectional lines, A8 to A15 and uh, AD0 to AD7, they are bidirectional. So anyway, they can give out the data. So if you want to give the address, you have to give the address to the external memory. So once the address is given, now the transfer of data should happen between those two memory locations. So for that purpose, it has been multiplexed to the lower order address bus. That way you save some additional number of pins. Otherwise, in place of 40 pins, you will have 48 number of pins in this IC if you work that way, right? So is the multiplexing of address and data bus understood by everyone? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is again a very simple concept and you can justify the reason that these address uh, buses from AD0 to AD7 are bidirectional because sometimes they, they act as address bus and sometimes they act as uh, data bus. However, the higher order byte of the address bus will always carry the address, right? So that is why, you know, it is only unidirectional, only in outward direction to the external memory, the address will be given. Now, one point of confusion here could be that if external memory is connected through these particular address and data lines to this particular 8085 microprocessor, when will the external memory know that address has been given and when will it know that the data has been given on this complete bus? So how to uh, resolve this uh, situation? I mean, at some point of time, you, you are saying that AD0 to AD7 will have data and at some point of time, AD0 to AD15 will have the address. So how will the external device know that at this point of time I have my address and at this point of time I have my data? So to be able to resolve that query, we have this signal address latch enable, ALE signal. So this address latch enable signal, it will be made one as soon as we put an address onto this line. As soon as we put address onto this AD0 to AD7 and A8 to A15, this address latch enable signal will be made high. What is the literal meaning of the word latch? What is the literal meaning of the word latch? You might have seen door latches. What is their purpose? So to close and open. To close and open. I mean, if you latch your room, whatever is in the room, it will be there. 
So similarly, this address latch enable signal, it is used uh, for two purposes. First of all, it indicates, I mean, when whenever microprocessor wants to put some address onto the address, but it will put the address there and it will also enable the address latch enable signal. So what will happen is uh, the ALE, when it is set high, it indicates that an address has been put on these address lines. And secondly, it is connected as an enable signal to one more external IC, which will store this address, which will store this complete address onto itself. That means whatever address has been put onto these address lines, we know that at, uh, after some point of time, uh, the data might be available on AD0 to AD7. So if the data will be available, uh, then what will I do? So a good idea is whenever this address latch enable signal is made high, you will be storing the contents of AD0 to AD7 onto some external IC, which is not the memory IC. It is some different IC, which I will show you in a moment. So onto that IC, the first byte or the lower byte of that address will be stored and the higher order byte, it will anyway contain address every time because it's only uh, single directional. So data cannot be transferred through this. So it will always contain addresses here. So ALE signal has two purposes. First of all, it indicates that address has been put onto this uh, address bus and this instructs an external IC to store this one byte of data in itself so that whenever this address latch enable signal is made low again, which will indicate that a data has been put onto this data bus. In that case, that stored data of addresses which you have taken from here and stored into the external memory location together with this particular address will be treated as the address as whole. So is this concept understood? What is the purpose of address latch enable? It actually latches or stores the data onto an external IC. We will get to know what that external IC is in a while. So is the purpose of this ALE clear to everyone? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so let me see how many people are present in the class today. I only see 87 people and your strength is about 110. So where are other people gone today? Do they not know that they will have a class here? But anyway, whatever is the case, they will not get the attendance in any way. So uh, we have discussed how to attach a externally interfaced memory through the multiplexed address and data buses and how to decode the address and memory signal by using this ALE version, right? Now, let us come to another point, another important point. Uh, suppose I am teaching inside a class, not online class, onto an offline class. I am teaching onto an offline class and I am teaching some important concept. Meanwhile, you get some doubt. So what will you do? Will you just start in, uh, will you just stand up and tell me to first clarify your doubt uh, and stop whatever am I doing? Or simply you will make, simply you will raise your hand and make a request. So whatever I am telling, I will complete my sentence and I know that you have raised your hand. So I will entertain your request after that. Which way is better? The first one or the second one? Second one. Second one, obviously, because uh, first way, that way you will be thrown out of the class. I mean, if you interrupt me and tell me, no, 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 first clear my doubt and then you can progress. So anybody will get irritated because if I'm in middle of saying something, I won't like to be interrupted. So uh, a, a neat way of making a request is you can simply raise your hand and I will complete whatever I was saying and uh, I will then tell you to ask your query. In similar way, 8085 in a circuit will be connected to various peripherals, right? And those peripherals are not usually very intelligent devices. They will be devices like pen drives, or they will be devices like monitor. They will be devices like some USB hub. They will be devices like some keyboard. So these are not intelligent devices, but they need the attention of this microprocessor. So that this microprocessor will process their data and accomplish their tasks. So at a point of time when microprocessor is busy, these external peripherals which are attached to it, be it memory, be it keyboard, be it monitor, be it any peripheral that is attached to this microprocessor, if that peripheral wants the attention of that microprocessor, it can do so, it can do so by using these pins, the pins that start from trap to INTA bar, that is from pin number six to pin number 11. There is an arrangement for external processor and their requests will be served or rejected depending upon this 
pin at which you have made the request so it's not that you know in uh, if 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 i am teaching in a class and if you are asking your doubts so uh, after completing my talk i can uh, always clarify your doubt but if i feel that this doubt is because whatever i have been speaking and as i speak the doubt will be automatically cleared so i will not entertain your interrupting request right i will i will just only say that your doubt will be clear as i speak so you please listen to me and then after i complete if you have any doubt then you let me know so as i speak your doubt must have been cleared so that request is not necessary so i have rejected your request so if you interrupt me there is a possibility that i will uh, give you the access request to me i will answer your doubt or i may not answer your doubt so it depends by which type you have interrupted me right for example if i am teaching in a class to students and somebody comes from outside and they tell me uh, to give attention so i will tell them no 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 you go now i am taking up my class and after that you interrupt me so in the similar way microprocessor reserves right to entertain or not to entertain the interrupt requests so first of all is the concept of interrupt clear to you why is it used yes sir yes sir okay so to be able to make the request of interrupts as i told you we have pins from trap to pins from this inta bar i will discuss these pins one by one but the only point to understand here is that that interrupts can be served or can be denied by the microprocessor and it all depends on how you have made the interrupt because there are various ways of giving an interrupt request to microprocessor now the first signal or the first input here is trap you will see that all of them are input signals because they have to interrupt the microprocessor only one of them is an output signal so we will discuss what it is so let's come to trap first trap means if there is a there is some critical situation in the system if there is fire in the system or if the device has been dipped into water so the microprocessor needs to stop immediately it needs to close all the operations because Uh, the electrical wirings which are carrying current should be stopped immediately to prevent any damage due to current so for such critical situations this trap interrupt is used right so this trap request i mean a request which is very very urgent can be made through this trap request and this trap request cannot be denied by the microprocessor it has to serve this request as it appears right then we have got Uh, so so i mean this trap happens to be a non maskable interrupts maskable means something which you can deny but non maskable will mean that something which you cannot deny so trap happens to be a non maskable interrupt whenever it appears that request has to be served right uh, now uh, inside the microprocessor whenever you make an interrupt request some pre written code is executed for example when trap appears you have to shut down the microprocessor so the process for shut down or halting the system will be written somewhere right so uh, that location is already predefined wherever that code is written that location is predefined and that is why trap is also called as a vectored interrupt by vectored interrupt we mean that the code for that particular uh, that that particular function which is to be executed when trap is made as an input is written at a predefined location in the external memory right so vectored means it has a predefined address and similarly non vectored will mean it does not have a predefined address so similar to trap there are instructions which are less severe reset 7.5 6.5 and 5.5 these are also vectored interrupts that means their locations where their code is predefined or pre stored is already defined it is already defined intr on the other hand is a interrupt which is not vectored user will be able to define a address for it where that uh, code should be stored and then after defining that address and the code at that address that can be executed right so is this clear to everyone what is vectored and non vectored interrupt and what is maskable and non maskable interrupt is the definition of both of that clear to everyone yes sir okay yes. so now sir yeah sir please summarize once again what do you want me to summarize vector interrupt 
See, vectored means uh, something which has got an address, right? Something which has got an address. So, trap uh, and reset 7.5, 6.5, and 5.5, they all have got an address, a predefined address in external memory location where the code which should be executed whenever these interrupts are made is already written in the external memory, right? And INTR does not have any address. So user will define an address for interrupts which are made through INTR and user will write the code at that particular location. So whenever INTR request is made, the control will be directed to that section of memory and that code will be executed. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Okay. And then what is this INTA bar? This INTA bar is a signal which microprocessor gives when it has accepted the request of any interrupt, right? You have made interrupts through either trap, reset, or INTR. Then, as I told you, that trap is a non-maskable interrupt. That means whenever trap request appears, microprocessor cannot deny it. So when it accepts the trap request, it will be providing a, a acknowledgement signal, interrupt acknowledge, INTA bar. It's active low signal. So whenever the value at this pin is zero, it means that the microprocessor has accepted your interrupt request and it will now serve that interrupt request. That is, it will go to that particular memory location and it will serve the code which is written there and it will come back to the original program for execution of the main program. So INTA bar is an acknowledgement pin. If the value of that is one, that means the microprocessor is not accepting your interrupt request, right? So some of the instructions are uh, maskable here and some of them are non-maskable. So I will let you know uh, their programming concepts when we will try to program interrupts in 8085 microprocessor. So this is regarding interrupting the microprocessor. Pins from trap to INTA bar are used for that particular mechanism, right? Now, uh, you have seen that the external memory which is interfaced to this microprocessor can have data from these address buses, right? Address and data buses. This is the address bus and the data bus which is of one byte will be able to copy one byte at once to the externally interfaced memory. In some cases, you want the operation to be serial instead of parallel. Since here you are transferring uh, eight bits simultaneously or one byte simultaneously through the data bus, so that is called as a parallel transfer, right? And if you want the data to be transferred bit by bit, then you have these two pins, serial input data and serial output data. So microprocessor can accept one bit of data from the external device, and it can also give one bit of data to the external device through serial input data and serial output data pins. So this is for serial input, and for parallel inputs, you already have the data bus here, right? So uh, if you see on the left-hand side, we have covered almost every pin. The crystal oscillators pin X1, X2, reset out pin, serial input output, the ways of interrupting the microprocessor, then all the data bus and address bus, which is multiplexed at the lower byte of address bus, as well as the ground signal. Is it clear to everyone? Pins on the left-hand side, all of the pins? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Okay, so now uh, let us move on to the remaining pins on the right hand side. On the right hand side, we have already covered this plus 5 volt pin, which happens to be the voltage supply. Then we have covered this reset in pin, and we have covered these higher order address byte pin together with this address latch enable. Now let us come to the discussion of the remaining pins one by one. Now there are two pair of pins which you see here, hold and hold acknowledge. Right, hold and hold acknowledge. What is the literal meaning of the word hold? What does hold means literally? Pouch. Uh, yeah, to grab the control of something, right? Hold means to grab the control of something. So microprocessor has got internal address and data bus. This is the data bus and this thing combined with this thing is the address bus. So it has got internal address and data bus. So this bus is responsible for the transfer of data and address within the microprocessor. Not addresses within the microprocessor, but the data inside the microprocessor is transferred through this data bus, right? 
we have seen this in the architecture portion also that data bus is connected within the microprocessor to transfer the data right so if some external peripheral happens to be faster than this 8085 microprocessor right so uh, if you try to transfer the data by using the microprocessor by using the uh, move command or by using hlprs pointer so that way your processor will be involved because accumulator register will be involved in transfer of data through ldex command uh, or if you even use this hlpr register as pointer then in that case also uh, most of the registers of this microprocessor will be involved and that will waste the time that microprocessor can spend on other tasks so for if an external uh, external peripheral is fast enough <coughs> sorry if an external peripheral is fast enough it can make a hold request hold is a input pin so that external peripheral can can make a hold request hold means it wants to grab the data bus and the address bus of the microprocessor so uh, without the intervention of this microprocessor it will be able to transfer the data at higher speeds so that is why this hold and hold acknowledge pin is used if your hold request is accepted this hold acknowledge pin will be floated as high value so that the control of your address and data bus will be given to the external device and without the intervention of microprocessor that device can transfer the data so hold and hold acknowledge pin serves that particular purpose right and if a slower peripheral is introduced i mean a peripheral which has a speed slower than microprocessor then you know the data transfer will not be properly synchronized so to maintain that synchronization this ready pin is used ready pin is used by the external peripheral as an input to the microprocessor to tell the microprocessor that okay now i am ready to transfer the data so you can take the data from me or give the data to me right so ready is used for synchronizing the slower devices to the microprocessor in the similar way hold and hold acknowledge might be used to give the control of address or data buses and in that way a faster device can be attached to this 8085 where the data transfer can happen fastly as compared to the speed of microprocessor so to be able to interface faster devices you have these two pins to be able to interface the slower uh, devices you have this ready pin right uh, however they can be used for any purpose but uh, usually hold and hold acknowledge for faster devices and ready for slower devices right now uh, the other signals that you see here io/mbar this means input output or memory uh, and then read bar write bar and then s0 and s1 signals these are all signals which will tell you uh, which peripheral are you dealing with so io/mbar i mean if the value of this pin is 1 then you are dealing with the input output device and if the value of this pin is 0 you are dealing with the memory device external memory device because this address and data bus will have addresses and data but to which device are they to be transferred to the input output device or to the memory device so that is decided by this particular pin and this is given as an activation signal to that particular ic whether the memory device or the input output device this signal will be connected as an activation signal right so if it is a input output device a one will be floated here so input output device should be active uh, high so that whenever a one appears it will be activated on this particular line and memory can be considered as a active low device whenever the value becomes zero here it will be activated even if the activation of memory chip is not low you can always apply a not gate and make it uh, an active low device right so whether you are dealing with input output or memory that will be told to you uh, told to you by this particular thing io/mbar then we will discuss this s1 signal a little later let us discuss this read or write thing so these are also active low signals and by now you already know what is the meaning of these active low signals right so uh, there will be address on and data on address and data buses at various times but sometimes uh, through this you want to input the data i mean this data bus that you have got it will it would like to copy the data from the external peripherals to the microprocessor or sometimes it will like to do the reverse way so 
by which signal it should be indicated it is indicated by the read or write signal these are activated when they are actually zero right so uh, whenever read signal is zero you want to uh, actually read something from the external peripherals or the memory into the microprocessor and when it is one you want to perform the reverse operation so read and write signals are used for that right and now out of the right hand side only s0 and s1 signals are remaining so you will see that these are status signals i will show a table in a while which will make the meaning of this clear so uh, apart from s0 and s1 is the meaning of every other one every other pin clear to everyone yes sir okay yes so let me now move on to the functional pin diagram on the left you can see that this is the diagram that we just saw uh, here you can also notice that cut which is present in the ic but this diagram does not indicates arrows right so it is just an ic diagram so that is why in the first slide i have taken this better diagram with arrows but it missed that u sign here now uh, this is the same diagram almost the same diagram here but on the right hand side you see the functional pin diagram of that what do you mean by functional pin diagram functional pin diagram is a pin diagram where the pins which are doing the similar tasks for example you can see trap to inta bar they were used for making interrupt requests so these pins are using similar kind of tasks so they are grouped together so you can see here that uh, trap to intr they are grouped together as input pins and they are uh, they are being used as interrupt group right or you can see that these are externally initiated signals so these are used for interrupting the microprocessor and then for acknowledgement you have got this interrupt acknowledge and hold acknowledge signal so they are give uh, the acknowledgement group or the external signal acknowledgement so these are the acknowledgement group then it, to be able to uh, reset the microprocessor or hold the microprocessor's uh, address and data buses or to tell the processor that it is uh, that the external peripheral is there need to transfer the data these pins are being used then there is similarly a higher order data bus which starts from 8 to 15 there is a lower order data bus which is multiplexed with uh, address bus i mean this is the higher order address bus this is the lower order address bus so lower order address bus is multiplexed with the data bus so you can see that this is bidirectional and here you can see the control signals are there because these signals are responsible for where to take the data from when to take the data this ale signal uh, read write signal io/m signal so it will specify whether you are dealing with memory or input output device or you want to read and write when to latch the addresses and when not to latch the addresses etc so these are called as control signals i will make the meaning of this s0 and s1 clear in a while and for resetting the system resetting the output uh, resetting the external devices we have got this reset out and for providing In the clock to them we have got a clock input similarly for serial communication you have grouped these together for providing the crystal oscillator ground signal and the voltage supply you have grouped these together so pins when they are grouped together with the purposes it creates a functional pin diagram right so any way is correct whether you understand it in this regular way or understand this in this way so both of the diagrams should be known to you and you don't need to remember these diagrams they will be provided to you in the examinations whenever required but you should obviously understand the meaning of every pin that we have studied here right now the meaning of s0 and s1 pins s0 and s1 pins so these are called as status pins and what is the purpose of status pins if the value of both of them is 11 11 that means we are doing opcode fetch if the value of both of them is 10 we are doing read 01 we are doing write and 00 we are halting the system so the context of this is suppose we have a command uh, say mvi a comma or let us say we have a command uh, lda lda and then we have given some external memory address let us say 2000 lda 2000 so uh, this command lda 2000 is stored in how many bytes in the external memory how many bytes will lda 2000 consume in the externally interfaced memory
3 it will consume 3 bytes because obviously 2000 is a hexadecimal number and uh, it will consume 2 bytes by itself so lda will take 1 byte so a total of 3 bytes will be taken in the external memory and uh, let me also show you that architecture diagram so things will become more clear uh, i think we have the architecture diagram here no so we have the architecture diagram here yes so this was the architecture that we studied on the last time from the externally interfaced memory we need to load the code lda 2000 first to be able to execute it so to be able to load lda that is first byte of data we will keep that first byte of data in the instruction register from the externally interfaced memory so that operation is called as opcode fetch lda is opcode so opcode has to be fetched inside that instruction register which will be the first byte then uh, we have got operand i mean we have got 2000 so there are two bytes of that so they will be fetched subsequently after that so these status bits that you see here the status bits that you see here they will tell you whether the opcode is getting fetched or you are reading the memory for fetching the operand or you are writing something into the memory like in if you want to uh, execute this sta2000 command then first of all you will load sta then you will load 2000 in two bytes and then whatever is the content of accumulator that is copied to the external memory location which is 2000 so in that case we can also do this write operation or in the last case we can have a halt operation so s0 and s1 will tell you the status of what is being done with the externally interfaced memory are we fetching the opcode are we fetching the uh, are we trying to fetch the operand or we are trying to write something into the memory or we are halting the system and uh, uh, this is an essential signal because uh, suppose if i write a command lda and after that i write a command mvi so this combination is bad because after lda we expect a uh 2 byte of data which is supposed to be the address so we cannot write mvi in our code it should give us an error so to monitor all those things this status lines will tell you an opcode has been fetched after that if the command requires the next expected thing is data so this status signals they monitor the status of that is this, is it clear to everyone the status signals yes yes sir. no okay now uh, if you couple this signal s0 and s1 with input output and memory slash signal i mean sometimes you will be reading memory and sometimes you will be reading the input output device so uh, if you if you, this is memory bar this bar is missing here so if you are making the signal of io slash m bar as zero then you are dealing with memory we have discussed this in our pin diagram so the signal that you see here io slash m bar it is a one bit output signal and if the value of the signal is one it means we are dealing with the input output devices or if the value of this signal is uh, zero that means we are dealing with memory so if you couple this signal io slash m bar with this s0 and s1 signal you can see that uh, this table will be expanded to this form so uh in, in three cases i mean 0 0 0 you are dealing with memory and in these three cases you are dealing with the uh input output device right and these three are the don't care cases so first we will discuss the memory cases if you are dealing with memory you know that 0 1 will stand for write so what are we writing since we are writing into since we are using memory because this signal is zero so this operation happens to be memory write then uh, if this is the case this is memory read then this is the case it is opcode fetch similarly the same operations can be done on input output devices also input output read input output write and then this 111 is actually used for interrupt acknowledge signal rest other combinations they are used for hold halt and reset hold halt and reset where some of them are don't care also so this is symbolically written as this write bar is equal to 0 read bar is equal to 0 read bar is equal to 0 because here you are trying to write so write signal has to be activated here you are trying to read so read signal has to be activated and so active low signal so it will be activated like this right so uh, this is the expanded table combining all the three signals and you can easily deduce the meaning of that if you know this simple small table 
right now let us uh, try to uh, assemble our microcomputer right so this is the microprocessor 8085 and peripherals are connected in this way you have the interrupt signal which is given to the peripheral uh, which is given from the peripheral to the microprocessor and uh, interrupt acknowledged is given from the microprocessor to the peripheral this peripheral might be a keyboard this peripheral might be a screen that you see on your computers this peripheral might be a usb drive so whenever a device wants to get their job done through microprocessor they will give an interrupt request and microprocessor depending upon the severity of the request or the way that interrupt has been made it will acknowledge the uh, interrupt request or it will deny it so that way the work of this peripheral will be done for example if you press something on your keyboard then those keystrokes are usually taken by the microprocessor and processed right so uh, in that time this will happen what are the instances when you press the keyboard and your microprocessor denies their request does it happen uh, sometime that you press your keyboard and your keys are not being accepted by the microprocessor in your computer systems yes sir when the windows starts or when when any operating system boots if you press any key there is no effect until unless the login screen appears right so at that time the request of keyboard is rejected so it happens right now let us come to assembling some more devices to the microprocessor this is 8085 device and here i have shown the address and data bus which is multiplex that is the lower order of lower order byte of the address bus and this is the address latch enable signal this is a latch latch by latch what we mean it is just a simple storage device which will be able to store one byte of data right so this lower order address bus or the data bus is uh, connected to this latch and whenever this ale signal is made as activated so this latch will be enabled and it will be keeping the data of uh, whatever is available on the data lines because that has to be treated as address and for the subsequent users the lower order byte of address will be stored here so it is decoded as a0 to a7 so these are your addresses and otherwise if this device is not activated i mean if this is zero if ale is zero that data will be taken by this data bus so is the assembling of this latch clear to all of you how this latch is attached to the 8085 microprocessor for demultiplexing the address and data bus yes or no are you all sleeping okay so this is a very simple assembling of that latch if you elaborate this structure further i mean i am trying to show you how this latch looks in terms of hardware so this is the structure of latch and this is a d flip flop you all are aware of what d flip flop is what is a d flip flop have you read the d flip flop earlier yes or no abhishek your voice is not audible yes sir so what does what is the purpose of using a d flip flop dono input kabhi bhi ek sath one nahi hone chahiye no no i am asking the purpose does it store one bit of data d flip flop is called as data flip flop and the primary usage of data flip flop is to be able to store one single bit so whenever the data input is made uh, uh, at the output of that that data will be available for one clock cycle so d flip flop is responsible for holding one bit of data so inside this memory chip eight such flip flops are attached which will be able to store complete one byte of data and these are the address lines ale signal for enabling or disabling this chip and these are the data lines so this is an elaborated diagram for this particular ic right after that uh, you can also you can also use the table that we have created earlier io/mbar read bar and write bar and these are the control signals so io/mbar read bar and write bar they are combined through this decoder they are combined through this decoder and input output write input output read memory read and memory write signals are generated although this decoder is unnecessary in our circuit but just to get uh, the quick response you can 
convert these signals, I mean input output slash memory and read and write path. So if you are trying to uh, deal with the input output, you can also read and write in that. If you want to deal with the memory, you can also read and write in that. So you connect a decoder here, the three inputs of which will be these signals. And at the outputs, you will be getting input output write, input output read, memory write, and memory read. So this is also an unnecessary thing that can be there in our system. But in some cases, it is useful, right? Uh, after that, this is the complete system that we have studied in today's lecture to be assembled. This is our microprocessor. There is a latch which is connected to the lower order address bus. So this is AD not to AD7. Here by mistake, I have written 7, but it is AD not to AD7. So multiplexed address and data uh, buses at the lower byte of address bus has been connected to a latch. And we have just seen that it is enabled by the ALE signal. And correspondingly, you will be getting these addresses here and the data here. So this needs to be connected. Again, the decoder that we have uh, seen in the previous slide, it is connected to the control signals and those signals are decoded for input output or memory reading and writing purposes, right? So this is how the basic minimum configuration is. I mean, to this microprocessor, you connect the crystal oscillator, you connect the power supply, and you connect these devices so that addresses and data should be interpreted accordingly and you have of course an external memory which will be connected to this address and data bus combined right so this is the basic minimum configuration that you need to uh, assemble your microcomputer system after that you can apply your keyboard monitor etc that we will see in this course how to apply the external peripherals and how they will function in conjunction with that right so is it clear to everyone Is the pin diagram absolutely clear to everyone? 